about in the class. Um, Scott established a case, and you need to go back and see the previous lessons in order to do this in detail again. But Scott was es establishing the case for biblical authority, that it truly is God's revelation to it truly is inspired such that we better pay attention to it and um, take it seriously. All authority rests in God the Father, and all authority was given to God the Son. And all truth was revealed through the Spirit in the first century. It was delivered once for all, Jude 3. And therefore, what we end up getting in what they received and then what they handed down, they wrote down their understanding so that we can read and we can understand God's plan, God's will, what we are to do. And Ephesians 4 ends up saying there should be a unity, a unity of the believers on that truth. There's one body, there's one spirit, there's one hope, there's one Lord, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father. There ought to be a unity in understanding those concepts and applying them accurately. Handling the word of truth accurately. And yet we end up seeing, unfortunately, since the first century, the splintering into different philosophies, into different theologies, into different teachings. But God, but what we need to do is be able to handle God's word accurately for ourselves and try to appeal to others of what we're understanding the truth of God's word to be. And one thing that we need to understand is the Old Testament with the patriarchal dispensation and the law of Moses, the Old Testament is there for a reason and is still there for an example to us, but it's not authoritative. Because the New Testament was the transition from that time of the law of Moses or the Gentiles under a patriarchal concept from that time to being subject to the law of Christ. And so we talked about that in detail. Then we talked about how God created language and communicates through language. And with that, there are just basic ways in which we understand each other. And if we violate those rules in common conversation, we get confused. And if we violate those rules in spiritual conversation, we get confused. But if we violate those laws of language, then we get the religious confusion that we end up seeing. But there are positive and negative commands. Therefore, there are sins either that we commit or that we omit doing the things that we are positively told to do. There are types of commands that are relatively general in nature. Go. Preach. Well, what? That's specific, the gospel. But there are different elements to the whole counsel of God. But there are positive and negative commands. There are, the, to the degree that the commands that apply to us today are general, then we have freedom to be able to choose the modes and methods to be able to get that done. When we're told to assemble, where to assemble, we're free to figure that out in order to worship God. But when there's something specific that's given, then that specificity and no alternative statements elsewhere to loosen that up means there's a specificity that we need to respect. And as one example, this isn't just... Scott Byard saying it and me repeating it or whatnot. As one example, Hebrews 7, verses 11 through 14. God interprets his own scriptures this way. And he, uh, the Hebrew writer, I'm going to get into that debate. 
the Hebrew writer ends up making a point that only makes sense if we're handling language properly. And that is, in the Old Testament, God had said Levites will be the priests. And the point being made in verse uh, 13 and 14 is there had to be a change of the law. There had to be a change of the law because Jesus is high priest now, but that can't fit under the old law because he was from the tribe of Judah. And it wasn't that God went through and said, priests can't be from Reuben, priests can't be from Simeon, priests can't be from Judah, priests can't be from all the rest of them. He spoke nothing concerning priests coming from Judah. And that silence, because it was specified otherwise, silence about any alternative means Levites are the only legitimate one. And so his whole theological argument, inspired theological argument, is that when it was specified one way, it negates everything else. Application. A lot of times we're tempted to say, when something has been specified, we're tempted to say, but he didn't say not to do this other form. And yet that Jesus, well, the Judaizing teachers who wanted to make following Jesus and also applying the law in other ways and keeping the law and all that kind of stuff, they could have come along and said, well, he didn't say not to be a priest out of Judah, and so the old law could still exist and Jesus be priest, even though he's, because God didn't say Judah couldn't. Actually, God did by what he specified otherwise. So we got to be careful about that, but he didn't say not to concept if it's been specified to the degree it's been specified. Okay. Um, what are individual responsibilities and opportunities? They abound. What is the purpose and work of the church? That's specified. And there are certain things that are specified about the nature of the church. And we talked about these things in detail before, so I'm not going to rehash all of that, but just a reminder of some of the things that we have talked about. There are direct statements, there are commands that apply to us, there are examples that are approved, and we're urged to imitate Paul or whoever, we're urged to imitate certain things by the examples that we see in the Scriptures. And there are inferences that sometimes are necessary. And when they're necessary, they're just as authoritative as the other forms of how we understand what we should do. Now, there was a term, Bible hermeneutics. I don't even care about hermit. Okay? But you can either have true hermeneutics, a way to truly handle the language, or you can have deviations away from it. And so one, at one place, uh, Scott ended up just describing it as a lot of the discussion that we're talking about is basically common sense in how we use language and just respecting that instead of trying to twist around it. So rather than following after deviations, we need to abide within the biblical balance. Now, this is where I get to go on my hobby horse for a little while. If any of you were here back in, it's been 2017 whenever I ended up doing this series, so my apologies. But I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit from the intro of the idea of the need for balance in a biblical sense. That's another way to describe this this approach to authority, is either we are handling the Bible, handling the word of truth, to find where the true balance is on grace, faith, and works, or this, that, or the other, whatever the issue is, you can get off away from the biblical truth by going off in this tangent, 
by taking a couple of passages to contradict some other passages or just ignore some other passages and take off in this direction. Or you can take the opposite passages and take off in that direction. And either way ends up being getting out into an extreme away from whatever God has defined as the balance of grace and faith and work. How do they work together, or are they opposed to each other? Well, some emphasize works to the neglect of grace. Some emphasize grace to the denial of work. But we're supposed to understand that grace and faith and works all are part of God's and that's the balance that is biblical. And so that's what we can think about some today are those types of consideration. First of all, we need to respect God's word. And we've established this a lot in the class in different ways up to now, but I think we need to reiterate it. What is all scripture? First of all, it's inspired, right? But what's it profitable for? It's right there. Everybody's like, am I supposed to read the slide? Well, yeah. I mean, we're supposed to read the scripture, right? Okay. It makes us adequate. Other translations say complete. Equipped for every good work. Do we recognize and respect the scriptures that the scriptures have for us everything that we need as far as being equipped for every good work as God's defined? All scripture is given to us. It'll reprove us sometimes. It'll correct us sometimes. It'll train us toward what is right. But every good work, the scriptures are our source material. So what are we supposed to be? Second word? Okay, what's diligent mean? Keep on, keep on going, keep on doing it. Actually caring to apply. Really putting energy behind trying to do what? Well, you want to be approved before God. You don't want to be ashamed, but what? Accurately handling the word of truth. We've got to be diligent about how we think about God's word, how we study God's word, how we apply God's word. So that we won't be ashamed. That's right. That's right. And that's the warning uh, on the flip side of that, right? And that's why the diligence has to be there, is um, there is an accurate or, or there is accurate or there is inaccurate. So the noble-minded ones approached being taught something spiritually in what way? They were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica because what? Okay. They were eager to hear, but they were also doing what? Examining or searching the Scripture. Just because somebody came and claimed something, they were checking the Scriptures to see whether or not it was actually the way Paul was saying. There's an Old Testament principle. Now remember, Old Testament is for our example. We can't go to it for, um, for all of our ways that we worship and all that kind of stuff, but we can go to it for the principles that are there, the examples that are there. And the statement back then, the idea was, whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to 
nor take away from it. There's a balance somewhere between adding extra stuff or not having everything in there. Well, in the New Testament, we see that at the end of Revelation. Be particularly careful with the book of Revelation. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. There's that same concept in the new covenant of don't add to, don't take away from. But we also see that in the idea that's given in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. What was the concern in Galatians? What's that? They were going to go back to the old law. They were wanting to hold on to the idea of Jesus to some degree, but they were wanting to apply certain things of the old law against the Gentiles, right? The Jews were wanting to... And yet that was called a distortion because they were pulling something from the old and bringing it into the new and adding it in and saying it was a requirement. And he said, I'm, you've, you're deserting the grace of Christ. It's, it's a different gospel. It's not really another. There are some gospel elements in it, but you've distorted things. And the warning is... Even if Paul and his companions, who'd already brought them the truth, even if they changed things from what they taught, they would be a Even if an angel came from heaven and taught something different than what they'd already been taught in the gospel, they would be a No one has the authority to distort God's gospel. And as we see from Galatians 5, verses 2 through 4, they're trying to apply, the, the, some of the Jews were trying to apply circumcision in particular. And in applying circumcision in particular, what's the result? If there were Christians who were trying to take the circumcision element out of the old law and say, this needs to be part of the new law. How's that described? If you try to get that one element, what, what are you obligated for? Okay, if you pull something out of the Old Testament, then you've got to keep the whole law, and if you're trying to then adopt the whole law on top of Christ, What's your relationship to Christ? Severed. Severed from Christ. If you're seeking to be justified in what you're doing religiously by the law of Moses, it was done by people in the law of Moses, then you have replaced the law of Christ with, oh, we're, we're putting the law of Moses back in here. Well, you're obligated to do everything in the law of Moses. That eliminates your relationship with Christ, and you have fallen from grace. Application. And we talked about this in another way before in the class. But God commanded worship with instruments in the Old Testament. Did God command worship? Did God accept worship in the Old Testament with instruments? Absolutely. Boy, there's a boatload of passages where it's command and examples all over the place. And uh, not just a piano. It was a whole bunch of different things. Some of the Psalms end up having... You know, praise with the trumpet, praise with the lyre, praise with this, praise with that. The symbols. Because that was part of the old law. It was the way David did it. It was the way Hezekiah reinstituted 
because it was commanded. And yet, what we see specified in the New Testament, in fact, whenever, I think it was referenced before, but the two places where psalms are quoted in the New Testament in order to talk about praise to God, both of the references that were pulled from the psalms in order to apply to New Testament stuff only spoke of singing because the rest only spoke of singing. And that's why the early church for centuries did not have instruments until they were added in later, and the two biggest arguments were, but God didn't say we couldn't do it, and but they had it in the Old Testament. But that's not a source of authority, in fact, if we're justifying ourselves by the old law, then Paul charges you've got to keep the whole law and you're severing yourself from Christ and you have fallen in grace. That same principle applies. Um, Second Peter 3, verses 14 through 18. How does Peter describe Paul? Do you think Peter and Paul were the same personality? Oh, they were both interesting personalities. And Peter even gets away by inspiration. Peter ends up getting away with saying, Paul writes some stuff that's hard to understand. even though what Paul was writing was also under inspiration. But what's the difficulty with some of the things that Paul wrote? I mean, he wrote the truth. He taught the truth. We have the truth in the Scripture. But some of those things that are hard to understand, the untaught or the unstable will distort. as they do all the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. Don't get caught up with following after distortions away from the truth. If Paul has said something difficult to understand, it doesn't come to the conclusion later on that grace negates works totally in every circumstance, because that's not truly what Paul was saying. Be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall. By the way, if there is a theology that says that Christians cannot fall from grace, that's following after a flavor of Calvin, not Christ. And so there's a warning here about falling from the steadfastness of the position that you have. You need to be careful about that. Some will follow after it, though. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4, ends up saying, the time's going to come when some will not endure sound doctrine. But if you want something else, then there's going to be teachers who will give you what you want. And they'll turn their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. Anything that is not of God's truth is a myth otherwise. And so that's something we need to be careful about. Um, When I was growing up, uh, I ended up, my older brother, and I, he was in high school, I was in junior high. We ended up enduring a divisive 
vision. That planted seed, not now, from my perspective, my brother ultimately is responsible for, despite the failings of some of the brethren, for coming to an understanding of what the truth is and holding on to the truth regardless of what that upset. He did not. And he just tossed these elements. He threw the baby out with bathwater. And uh, when he did, I... I actually was watching him do so and coming up behind. And what it really made me do was it really made me for sure have to check where is, where's what's right. And so I questioned a ton of stuff that I grew up in. I was blessed to grow up with this training, with this truth. But I had to figure out, is my, is my brother figuring out something that's right, or is what Dad says actually biblically based? And then for my own family... I really got scared for Morgan and Ethan and Rachel because unfortunately we had a period of time in which we had to struggle through what ended up being a divorce. When they were in high school and junior high, and it was just like playing in my mind all again of, I particularly worry about the young people when the vision happens. Or when troubles happen that hopefully don't turn into a full division. But one of the reasons why division is so bad is because the next generation is the most vulnerable. This isn't because my daddy thinks so. It's because the scriptures are these principles. And yet I've got to own it, either believe it for myself, not because anybody, friends or otherwise, I've got to come to wrestle with it to really apply it to myself and help the kids that are still under my tutelage to have that foundation to try to pass it on to the next. But let's talk about biblical balance for a little bit so that we see again that these are scriptural principles and why we need to be content within the balance. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. By the way, Jesus challenged the majority religious views of, those, of that day. There were lots of popular views religiously, and he challenged it with the truth. And how he challenged the Pharisees was he said, you are paying so much attention to the details, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You've neglected justice and mercy and faithfulness. If we get so centered on the detail that we don't have justice and mercy and faithfulness, if we end up talking about obedience or works where we don't have grace as part of that discussion, grace mercy and justice and faithfulness, then we're out of balance. 
On the flip side was the Sadducees, and I didn't pull the scripture for that one, but what, he didn't deal with the Sadducees as much because they didn't take the scripture seriously. In fact, the only thing he really does is he just broadsides them and says, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And so people who are loose about the Bible, unfortunately, they don't know the scriptures or the power of God. But if we do know the scriptures and all we're worried about is the nth detail without grace or mercy or faithfulness or justice, we are out of balance. We, but what does he say? These things you should have done without neglecting the others. So he doesn't say all that matters is justice and mercy and faithfulness. Forget about obedience. He says, yeah, you need to obey, but you shouldn't be neglecting the big picture of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You need both. That's the balance. And if we do one, neglecting the other, either way, we're out of balance. John 4, 23 and 24, how are we supposed to worship? In spirit and in truth. What happens if we worship in spirit without truth? What happens if we worship in truth without the proper spirit about it? We're, everybody needs truth. Is Every soul needs truth. Well, every soul needs spirit. And either our worship is properly balanced, being truthful, but also of the appropriate spirit to approach God. Or we follow our feelings regardless of what the truth says about how God wants to be approached. Or we go through the motions of doing what is true, but without approaching God with the right spirit. We have to have the balance. That's what God requires. Are religious traditions bad? Are religious traditions bad? Well, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9, I'm going to summarize here. He ends up, what the, the Pharisees are trying to charge the disciples with not handling things properly because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. By the way, I'm kind of a fan of the Pharisees wanting you to wash hands before you eat, okay? But... Those filthy-handed disciples hadn't actually broken the law. But instead, Jesus turns it on them and says, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And they end up having a way in which they talk themselves through a scenario by which they can set aside the command of God. And he says, By this you invalidated the word of God. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Those religious traditions that invalidate the word of God are bad. But what does 2 Thessalonians 2.15 say? Paul says, hold the traditions. Hold the traditions that you've been taught by godly people telling you godly things. There are godly traditions. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And so there are these traditions of men that come about that are separate from, different from, what Christ wants us to be doing. Those are bad. 
a, a religious philosophy that is known as Calvinism because it came from John Calvin, that ends up influencing so many modern denominations or their offshoots. Maybe they're no longer calling themselves a particular denominational brand name, but they're some sort of a community church that is warmed over Calvin theology. That's what a lot of them are. That ends up following after the philosophies of a set of beliefs that are, inter I have five, there are five points of Calvinism, that are internally consistent but contradict basics of Scripture. You can fall away from it. Don't deny that there are some things you're supposed to obey and submit to. Why does it matter? When Jesus ends up handling this challenge of his authority, he says there's two sources of authority. Either heaven sent that, man, or men made up that command. And if it's not from heaven, they even recognized it would be ill Application. Um, did God command that baptism is for the forgiveness of sin? connected baptism to washing away sins and calling on the name of the Lord. Connected baptism and washing away of sins, even though he'd been involved in fasting and praying for three days straight, already recognizing Jesus as Lord. Does God command baptism because it's a burial connected with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because we're dying to sin and we're rising from baptism to walk in newness of life. Did God command baptism such that Peter ends up saying, baptism now saves us? Or... Is it true that we're called upon to pray a sinner's prayer in order to be saved and then soon thereafter be baptized to show the salvation that you already received? Which one of those aren't compatible as far as being the truth within God's word. Which one of those is the tradition that is of God, in which one of those is a tradition that man has devised, a lot of it being based on influence from the Calvinism concept of if you are baptized, then you're doing a work, and if you're doing a work, then you're earning your salvation. It is a logical whatever that is contradicting the Scripture. And so when you go back and you look and say, why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? By this, you invalidated what the Word of God said for the sake of your tradition. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, just the claim of Jesus being Lord is not sufficient. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. There's going to be many who end up recognizing Jesus as Lord, even thinking that they've done miracles in his name. And yet, if they actually weren't doing what his will revealed, Jesus says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness without law. There is a law of Christ. Part of that theology ends up saying, well, there's the Old Testament law, but then we're free from law. There is a law of Christ. 
And those who deny that there is a law of Christ are ripe for, unfortunately, being in the realm of lawlessness. How can we find the balance that is biblical? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately the word of truth. If there is anything that I've said in general or about the two examples that I've talked about with instrumental music, there's more that could be said. With baptism, there's more that could be said. Then let's talk about it together. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. Let's sit down and examine the scriptures together. As much as we need to, to see whether or not these things it's important for us to be reminded of these basic principles of the Lord's Church. That there are basic truths and basic ways of understanding and understanding handling the Scripture. I really appreciate Scott's approach through all of those lessons. I hope they were helpful for you. Feel free to go back and visit them. But we have the word of truth that we have to handle accurately. And we, to the best that we can, we need to apply that to ourselves first and then appeal to others that there is a path toward unity in serving God together based on what the Scripture says. Thank you so much for your patience with this discussion.